Greetings and welcome to session six of our seminar on confronting evil in history. Today, we're turning to the topic of how philosophers have confronted the topic of evil, human evil, historical evil, and maybe more profoundly, how philosophers should try to confront the problem of evil or the situation of evil. So how should philosophers think about evil events in history? Is the philosopher's role something um, similar to the way that we treat other philosophical problems? Um, do we, should we use tools of analysis and conceptual distinction to provide a clarification of the concept of evil? Is it our role to adjust and formulate a philosophical anthropology or a general theory of human nature and the human condition in order to show how evil events can arise from normal human beings. Or perhaps the role of the philosopher is to provide a moral basis for special judgment and special condemnation of atrocities and the occurrence of evil. And I would like for all of us to think about whether any of these conceptions of the task of philosophy, whether these conceptions are adequate for thinking about the Holocaust, the Holodomor, or the totalitarian re repression of the Soviet state. Often when philosophers in the history of philosophy have spoken about the problem of evil, they have thought about it in theological terms. How could a benevolent God permit evil actions and occurrences? But this is not the approach which I'm recommending for us and not the approach which was taken by the philosophers whom we're reading today. Rather, we are looking for a secular philosophical understanding of evil. How are evil and atrocity different from ordinary crime and ordinary human cruelty? We have to recognize, we have to think about, we have to reflect on the fact that human beings make history. History is nothing but the cumulative contribution of many millions, billions of human individuals doing things for reasons, according to passions, in conjunction with each other, in competition with each other, human beings make history. But we can ask the question, are human beings inherently good? As Martin Luther King uh, believed, does the arc of history uh, bend always towards justice? Or are human beings inherently capable of doing evil? And then finally, crucially for this course, are human beings capable of changing over time? Another important question for a philosopher of history to consider is whether there are supra-individual human creations that contribute to evil. Um, cons constructions like you know, even architecture or ideology or uh, systems of law or systems of racism. Are there supra-individual human creations which contribute to evil? And here we will be referring today and have referred in the past several weeks to uh, topics of ideology, to state and political institutions and the wielding of collective power. We've referred also to group identities, uh, what um, we can refer to as racism or xenophobia or nationalism. The idea in um, Socrates, we Greeks versus the barbarians, we Aryans versus the Jews and the Slavs, we whites versus the other races on the face of the earth, or we Catholics versus the Protestants. And you can fill in the blanks. Each of these is a conflict which we have a reasonably good historical acquaintance with. And th then finally, we can ask the question whether stories and narratives of hatred and antagonism towards the other and the resentments which are historically transmitted through stories of hatred and antagonism, whether these stories themselves are a cause of evil actions in the future. Here is a philosophical question, and it's, it's uh, in one sense, it's a familiar philosophical strategy. Can we come up with a conception of community and polity, of social group and state that makes atrocities within the group and across groups 
substantially unlikely. It's, it's kind of the question of um, the ideal society or utopia or possibly uh, the social contract theory. Are there arrangements which lead to peace and justice among um, a wide range of individuals? And how about this as a conception, um, a, a community, a polity of individuals who are motivated by these elements, a degree of limited benevolence towards each other. Benevolence, meaning that individuals care to some extent about the well being of other people, including anonymous other people, but limited in the sense that human beings are not angels, they are not pure altruists. Secondly, let us imagine that our group of individuals share a degree of tolerance and respect for all human beings, both the human beings with whom they are directly connected and other human beings with whom they are not directly connected. Third, we might imagine a motivation, a moral motivation among these idealized individuals um, that leads to an adherence to fair and impersonal rules of social and legal action. And then finally, we might imagine that moral personality plays a role, moral character plays a role in this society, that individuals at the individual level possess a strong motivation of integrity and acting rightly towards others, even when strong pressures are exerted against them. This is one reason why I was eager to have you read about um, Vasily Grossman, who did manage to maintain his integrity in the context of a highly coercive society. This model is a thought experiment, but I suggest that we try to think it through. Would this kind of community populated with people with the moral and political psychology that I've just described, would that community be one where hatred, cruelty, and indifference to the sufferings of others could emerge and thrive? Would hatred emerge in such a society? And then secondly, would a community like this be stable or are there ordinary forces of friction and conflict that would lead to faction, competition, hatred, and murder? And you may notice that there's a parallel between these questions and the history of political theory from roughly 1600 to the present, and especially within the social contract theory of John Locke, Thomas Hobbes, Rousseau, Kant, and eventually John Rawls. So that was one thought experiment, but now let's consider an anti-utopian thought experiment, a different philosophical anthropology. Let's imagine a collection of individuals with antisocial or non-social traits. These individuals are characterized by suspicion and fear of others. They possess insatiable desire for more power and more material goods. Some of them possess an ability to persuade others through lies, distortions, and legends to believe that one's neighbors are a threat and must be feared and dominated and perhaps killed. So this is, I, I didn't label it here, but we might call this the characteristic of charisma the idea that some human beings are especially able to be persuasive through lies, distortions, demagoguery, legends, to, to um, lead one's fellow citizens, one fe one's fellow members of society to be fearful of other members of society and therefore to uh, be hostile towards them. And we can also ask, is this the world that Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes in Leviathan imagined in the state of nature where life would always be in quote, continual fear and danger of violent death and the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish and short. Is suspicion, fear and competition the root of these negative outcomes for human society? We can also ask, now that we're thinking about philosophical anthropology, we're thinking about the nature of human beings, we can ask whether human beings are fundamentally reflective and reasonable. Do they act out of a reflective consideration of what they believe and want? Are they rational in some sense? Or are human beings irrational? 
motivated by many external influences, hidden passions, emotions, which they don't understand and which um, guide them um, to um, rash action and who are easily manipulated by unscrupulous political leaders. Are we readily turned into the Stanford prison guards or the organization men and women that we've heard about in several of the presentations recently? Or into the ordinary men, the policemen who travel to Ukraine and shoot thousands of innocent fellow human beings? We can ask the question, do we gain more insight into human nature from Locke, Hobbes, Rousseau, or Nietzsche, or eventually Himmler? So let's turn now to John Keats and his, uh, I think, very interesting book. It's not, a, it's not the last word to write on the question of philosophers confronting evil, but it's a good start. It's, it's a, an engaging book. And John Keats um, begins by trying to give a working definition of evil. And he offers three or four characteristics. Uh, first, that evil involves serious harm causing fatal or lasting physical injury. For example, murder, torture, and mutilation. Second, evildoers are not just unscrupulous in their choice of means, but are motivated by malevolence to gratuitous excess. They treat their victims with ill will, rage, or hatred. Third, for an event to be called evil, according to Keeks, there is no morally acceptable excuse for the action. Now, this is an important point because he's basically qualifying the first two points. There may be an action or an event which causes serious harm and is um, motivated by malevolence, but for which there is a morally acceptable excuse. So it is excusable and therefore it is not evil. So his summary then is that the justified description of evil to an action requires motive, consequence and lack of excuse. This is Keeks's first effort at analyzing what is evil. But I'd like to ask you, is the most important problem that of understanding the causes of evil actions or to offer a definition of evil or to understand the states of mind and motivation of evildoers? What is it that we need to understand when we would like to understand evil events like the Holodomor Stalin's state's uh, decision to murder by starvation millions of Ukrainian peasants, or Hitler's uh, determination to exterminate all Jews in Europe. Here is Keats's uh, description of his approach. An initial characterization of my approach, then, is that it combines the following claims. Evil has many causes. The scheme of things, the way the world is, is non-moral. We, we human beings have basic propensities for both good and evil actions, and thus we are ambivalent towards good and evil. Ambivalent doesn't mean here uh, we're of mixed emotions. It means rather we, we can commit both good and evil. Evil actions may be reasonable, and evildoers may be held responsible for both intentionally and unintentionally evil actions. This is a very dense paragraph and every sentence or every phrase uh, deserves discussion. One idea which I think is especially important for our consideration for the topics that we are trying to understand in the course is the analysis that he gives of the role of ideology as a motivating factor for mass-based evil action. He offers the example of the Great Terror, which occurred during the French Revolution under the leadership of uh, the Revolutionary Party and Robespierre, the fanatic philosopher, during which great atrocities occurred in many places in France. Robespierre, uh, as I say, revolutionary and philosopher, excelled in moralistic demagoguery. Demagoguery means persuasiveness on false grounds. Robespierre persuaded the people, the people of the revolution, the people who believed in him to follow him in bloodletting. And this involved killing anyone suspected of being an enemy of the revolution, an enemy of the Republic. And they were motivated by an ideology 
advocated by a highly persuasive demagogue, Robespierre. Here's a definition of an ideology. An ideology is a coherent worldview used to understand the prevailing political conditions and to suggest ways of improving them. When I mentioned enemies of the Republic, I hope you will keep that phrase in mind as we move forward to the 20th century and recall the rationale for the great terror in the Soviet Union, which involved rooting out the enemies of the revolution and the enemies of the working class. Here are just a few um, statements about Robespierre as a zealot, as an extremist, as a lunatic, um, but very powerful orator, very powerful persuader of his followers. Robespierre said, quote, we must exterminate all our enemies with the law in our hands. The Declaration of Rights offers no safeguard to conspirators. The suspicions of enlightened patriotism might offer a better guide than formal rules of evidence. That is, the rule of law is put aside. And in commenting on an execution, Robespierre said, even if he had been innocent, he had to be condemned if his death could be useful. And in a letter advising the Revolutionary Tribunal, Robespierre wrote, people are always telling judges to take care to save the innocent. I tell them to beware of saving the guilty. These, again, these are comments which are very well chosen by Keats. They are very reminiscent of the terror in the Soviet Union in the 1930s, but they also are reminiscent of Tim Snyder's um, incredibly important points about the destruction of the state, that atrocity, Holocaust, genocide, and great evil occurs primarily when the institutions of the state and the protections of individual citizens have been smashed and destroyed. Is there such a thing as excusable wrongdoing? For example, can we excuse the perpetrator if the perpetrator believes that his or her action was right? Uh, quoting from Keats, the assumption underlying this defense is that people should not be held responsible for evil actions if they sincerely believe that their actions are not evil. This assumption is false. In other words, Keats believes, no, we cannot and should not excuse evil action for, on this ground. And the defense of Robespierre, who was fully committed to his atrocities, is untenable. If the assumption were true, it would have the absurd consequence of exempting the responsibility SS concentration camp guards if they were sincere Nazis, KGB torturers provided they were committed communists, Islamic terrorists, if they were truly fanatical, rapists, if they were really convinced that women liked it, and so forth. In other words, ideological beliefs, um, ungrounded beliefs, kind of crazy beliefs about uh, the, the context of the evil action that they've committed is not an excuse for having committed the action. This particular individual, Franz Stengel, that you've read about was commandant of Treblinka, that very same death camp that you read a little bit about um, through the post about um, um, Vasily Grossman. And he is portrayed as an ordinary man. This is very significant for the work we're gonna be doing later in the semester. He is not portrayed by Keeks or by the um, very experienced person who interviewed him. He's not portrayed as a psychopathic killer, but just a policeman with ambition on the way up. Quoting from Keeks, the prospect of promotion and other rewards for his loyalty and efficient service were dangled before him and threats for disloyalty were implied. None of this was said plainly, but it was intimated in a way that was at once deniable and yet menacing. Globochnik took no note of his previous request for another assignment. Stengel then accepted the job of being commandant at Treblinka. Now we can ask the question, did Stengel have a choice? And it is perfectly plain that he did have a choice. I've referred several times to the, uh, the theologian uh, who resisted Hitler and resisted to the end of his life. He was arrested imprisoned, tortured, and eventually executed by the, by the Gestapo, he made a choice and Stengel also could have made that choice. 
Keats, as a philosopher, is very concerned and interested in the question of responsibility and intentionality. What are we responsible for? And what outcomes did we intend? And what is the relationship between what we intended and what we are responsible for? Um, to say that um, I am a commissar and I believe that these kulaks were enemies of the revolution, for example, that may be my justification, that may be my excuse, but Keats says this is not sufficient as a moral excuse for the behavior of the commissar. His, his, his basic view about responsibility is that the individual's duty is to struggle hard to break the bonds of lies and ideology that are brought forward to justify his or her actions and then to choose independently to do right. Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, is the morally admirable individual and the commandant of Treblinka is the individual whose behavior we should avoid. Another important idea, which is brought forward by Keeks, it's one reason why I think this book is um, worth our consideration, is um, his emphasis on the importance of moral imagination. Uh, quoting from him, moral imagination is the attempt to appreciate other ways of life by coming to understand them from the inside as they appear to those who are actively engaged in them. The benefits of moral imagination are many, but three are particularly important in the context of coping with evil. First, the evildoers in the six cases thought their actions were not evil partly because they grossly misperceived their victims. I won't go on to the other two. But I, what I would say is, this is there's a flag here. There's something important here. What he's referring to as moral imagination, we could also refer to as compassion and empathy. It is a question of seeing the other person or perhaps the, the group of other people, um, seeing the individual and this group as real human beings and that their experiences are real, important, and compelling. And in fact, when we read Martha Nussbaum uh, close to the end of the course, we will see that she believes that um, this feature of moral imagination and compassion, these are the key to social morality, more basic than principles like do no harm or you know, the principles that we get from Kantian um, moral theory. So the importance placed on moral imagination, uh, this does seem like a very important clue to, the, um, to understanding and uh, maybe remedying or preventing in the future the occurrence of evil actions like extermination and torture of innocent people, the idea that every individual should be encouraged and taught how to exercise his or her moral imagination and compassion for other human beings. Keats writes, it is reasonable to conclude then that if moral imagination had enabled evildoers to understand better their victims and their own motives and to realize that they had attractive alternatives to evil doing, then they would have been less likely to become or to continue as evildoers. And another important quote, the cultivation of moral imagination in this way provides not only personal enrichment, but also a moral force that can help make lives better and cope with evil. And I would say that th it's, um, we're a long ways in the United States from Holocaust and genocide and mass imprisonment and so forth. But the goals of inclusiveness and mutual respect, which we embody at the University of Michigan Dearborn, the idea of understanding each other across racial lines and religious lines and gender and sexual lines those values are exactly what Keats is describing as the cultivation of moral imagination and understanding the life situation of the other person and the value of the life situation of the other person. Another important idea in Keats is uh, what he refers to as external restraints on evil. This also is an important piece of Keats's argument and it converges with uh, Timothy Snyder's central ideas having to do with the crucial role of the state, the system of law, and the system of institutionalized protections of individuals against crime and atrocity. 
In other words, what this is doing is it's moving our focus a little bit from the mental state of the perpetrator to the institutionalized and legally defined and socially defined context of their actions and the restraints which exist to discourage or prohibit or punish actions which are evil. Keeks and Snyder are not making exactly the same point, but the reasoning converges in the circumstances of Hungary, Ukraine, um, Estonia, Soviet Union, and so forth. So here are uh, four or five, four ideas which uh, Keeks puts forward on how to cope with evil. First, the cultivation of moral imagination because it changes the internal conditions and makes evil doing less likely. Second, the enforcement of strong prohibitions because it changes the external conditions and may deter evil doing. Third, enforcement by threatened or actual punishment for violations. So enforcement is an important remedy to potential evil. And fourth, holding evildoers responsible both for their intentional and unintentional violations, provided they have the capacity to foresee the readily foreseeable consequences of their actions or ex excusing them if they lack that capacity. Let's uh, now shift gears a little bit to um, a book that you've read only a little bit of, Claudia Card's book, Confronting Evil. It's a, it's a valuable book and uh, some of you might want to read more of it, but I wanted you to get some exposure to her book. So she points to, um, her, she does not try to give a general definition of evil. Instead, she um, tries to indicate what she means by evil by pointing to instances. The Nazi extermination of the Jews, Stalin's gulags, the 1937 rape, rape of Nanking, the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing, the 1964 murder of three civil rights workers, Cheney, Goodman, and Schrenner in Mississippi, and the dragging murder of James Byrd in Jasper, Texas in 1998. She takes these as a small handful of examples of human behavior towards other human beings, which goes vastly beyond crime and which she, she classifies as evil action. And she does ask the question, why should we focus on evil or on evils, uh, actions that are evil? Why should we distinguish evil from lesser wrongs? One reason is to help set priorities when resources are limited for preventing wrongs and repairing harms. Another is to set limits to excusable forms of defense against or retaliation for atrocities perpetrated or threatened by others. With regard to the first of these concerns, the temptation is often to address lesser wrongs first, deferring indefinitely attention to real evils. Lesser wrongs can be easier to repair, but evils are urgent. Life and basic quality of life are at stake. She refers to several theories of evil behavior on the part of evildoers that we've already considered. It's, there's a nice convergence between some of the ideas we've seen in other contexts and the theory of atrocity and evil, which Claudia Card puts forward. Uh, she refers to Hannah Arendt's theory of the banality of evil, kind of the, um, the uh, routine exercise of activity, which in its effect and its foreseeable effect is Atro atrocious. Uh, secondly, she refers to the Stanford prison experiments um, with the very clear implication that she's um, concerned about the malleability of individuals' willingness to do increasingly bad things. And then likewise, the Milgram experiments, uh, those are the shock experiments, which indicate that individuals are willing to uh, apply increasingly strong electric shocks to innocent individuals simply because they've been instructed to. And she thinks that these observations, these, these uh, interpretations by Hannah Arendt and these experiments in social psychology enhance the common sense idea shared also by John Keeks that a bro broad portion of humanity is capable of evil action in the right circumstances. And 
I believe that Tim Snyder takes this view as well, that evildoers are not a tiny kind of distinct minority of a given society. Rather, the vast majority of human beings can be put into circumstances where they will commit evil and atrocity. Uh, now a few more comments about the nature of evil. And here she does try to offer a little bit of a definition. As I now define them, evils are reasonably foreseeable, intolerable harms produced by inexcusable wrongs. And there's a strong parallel here between Card's um, definition or kind of conceptual analysis and Keeks's analysis. Going on about excusable, inexcusable wrongs are frequently matters of succumbing to temptation, failing to think a thing through, failing to identify and examine assumptions critically, or caving in to peer pressure. These are weaknesses not ordinarily malevolent. Temptation and pressures sometimes excuse, but not always. Temptation can exert an attraction, curiosity, for example, and pressure can exert an influence, threats of disapproval, without providing a good reason. Here, we can kind of relate this to the career of the commandant of Treblinka. The inducements, the temptations that he had were advancement in the police service, and the pressures were thinly veiled threats that things will not go well for you if you don't do as we instruct you. But she would um, clearly regard both the pressures and the temptations involved in his career decisions, his life decisions, his action decisions, as not rising anywhere near the threshold needed uh, for providing a justification or an excuse for his behavior. And so she explicitly uh, frames the question, could Stengel have offered convincing excuse for his behavior as an efficient commandant at Treblinka? And her answer is no. A somewhat harder question is whether choosing the lesser evil is an excuse um, for having performed that lesser evil. And here, um, Card refers to a suggestion by John Rawls that um, enslavement, normally regarded as an atrocity and, um, and evil, but he, Rawls apparently makes a comment, I had, hadn't recalled this comment, that enslavement of Greek prisoners of war is a lesser evil than massacring them and therefore is excusable. This seems to me like a slippery slope. And in fact, I won't leave that slide yet. A slippery slope because we might say they're both atrocities and neither action should be taken, neither the massacre of prisoners nor the enslavement of prisoners. Uh, finally, I asked you to read about 200 words from Susan Neiman's book on uh, evil in the history of thought. And the one idea that I'm interested in, um, I mean, it's a very interesting book, it's a worth, worth reading, but only a small part of the book contributes to our central questions. Um, but what she raises is the idea of the plasticity of human nature. And she attributes this idea to Rousseau, though presumably there are antecedents that go back further, but the idea that human nature changes over time and that this is an explanation both of the emergence of evil, bad actions, evil actions, atrocities, but also uh, possibly a promising possibility for the future, that human nature may change in a direction that makes atrocity less likely. This idea of the changeability, the plasticity of human nature, raises the possibility that our cultural and value systems may improve over time, or they may degenerate. A Socrates or a Bonhoeffer, a Bonhoeffer being the theologian I've referred to several times, executed by the Gestapo, may make a powerful contribution to how we humans think of a life well lived. This is, I think, an important point, though uh, she doesn't put it in exactly these words, but one idea that we might have is that new insights that help us um, do what Keeks argues, exercise our moral imagination, or what Nussbaum argues, uh, be empathetic and um, 
to try to understand the position of the other person, that these um, capacities in the human being may be powerfully stimulated by the, the thinking and prodding of a Socrates or of a Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And as a result, we may make a different kind of history altogether. We might imagine that G West German politics um, changed dramatically. We might imagine that, though we have to be very careful in the assumptions that we make because of what we've learned from Judd about the myths which um, governed a lot of the reconstruction of Europe after World War II. But we might imagine that the shock of the realities of the Holocaust, the evils of the Holocaust, the atrocities of the Holocaust created a new democratic political mentality for Germany, which permanently changed German history. We might hope that. So we, we will be returning to philosophers uh, throughout the course periodically, but I wanna ask a preliminary question here, whether these theories and distinctions by the philosophers help us in the primary question we're posing here in this course, how to confront and learn from the evils of the 20th century. And I'm not completely convinced that they have helped a lot. Um, they certainly have not resolved the issue. They have focused largely on the behavior of the individual evil, evildoer, though Keeks does refer to external factors like the state, so that's good. Um, and they have highlighted the importance of compassion and moral imagination, also good. But it seems to me that the hard question still remains. How could a mass society representing the most excellent products of European culture give rise to such horrific, murderous, widespread, and inhuman plans and actions as the extermination of Europe's Jews? That is an evil mass state-based action which philosophy still has not illuminated for us.